Recording this program is entirely fictional and made by a sole Canadian man. All characters and events in the show, including the host, even those that are based on real people, are entirely fictional. The following program contains mature subject matter. Viewer discretion is advised. America, the land of the free, home of the brave, and the stupid, and the criminally insane. The United States has seen its fair share of gangbangers, mobsters, and psychotics who've roamed our beloved streets, causing untold chaos, destruction, and corruption. Tonight on Grand Theft Auto Biography. Construction, bribery, and good old-fashioned gang wars. Tonight we will take a look at the life of one of America's most notorious land developers, who left his low-cost, high-profit mark all across this great nation. We will examine a real estate magnate who not only used every dirty tactic in the book, but more than likely wrote the book himself. A proud man who never hesitated to bribe, threaten, or kill just about anyone that stood in his way, whose legacy of intimidation still lingers in the modern-day criminal underworld. We will see riots, false flag operations, and bitter revenge as we document the known criminal history of the one and only Avery Carrington. This episode of Grand Theft Auto Biographies brought to you by my incredible supporters on Patreon, and a special thank you to my executive producer tier patrons, Mo S, XX Anti Tricks Never Sorry 17 XX, Wiggly Pizza Pants, and Ezra Hambrick. Ezra also has a YouTube channel, Scott Games 99, where they play games like Red Dead Redemption 2, MLB The Show 22, Vice City Definitive Edition, and more. So go support the show by showing them some love. Get access to all of the perks listed on the screen at Producer Tier, or promo your own content by becoming an Executive Producer Patron. Help me reach my Season 3 goal so I can continue producing shows for you guys for a long time to come. Thank you for watching, and enjoy the show. The early life of Avery Carrington is shrouded in mystery, as is often the case here on GTA Biographies. However, it is also often the case that we should speculate on what led him to his most infamous associations based on what little information we do have. According to our research, Avery was born in Texas, likely in the year 1935, although the source for this figure has been occasionally misinformed in the past, so this date should be taken with a grain of salt. Who his parents were specifically remains a mystery, despite the fact that Avery himself would frequently reminisce about his father, who seemed to have imparted a large part of his own personality onto his son. Being a native Texan, presumably just like his father, we speculate Avery would grow up with a fascination and idolization of the American cowboy, as by the time he was an adult, he would dress almost exclusively in vests, jeans, and was almost never seen without his signature cowboy boots and hat. While it isn't known for a certainty, it is believed that Avery would begin his business back in Texas, perhaps using a substantial inheritance or loan from his father to begin buying up property left and right. It must be emphasized that while we do not know if Avery came from wealth himself or built himself up from scratch, the former seems far more likely to our investigative team, based solely on his clear disregard for practically everyone around him, and especially the poor. Given that he so often invoked his father for teaching him how to be a businessman, it can also be assumed that Avery learned his signature aggression from Carrington Sr. as well. He would become known for using the most underhanded tactics imaginable in order to ensure whatever deal he was making benefited him as much as possible. He would see no issue morally or otherwise with inciting violence, bribery, physical intimidation, or even outright murder, as long as it made him just a bit wealthier and more importantly, the winner. In fact, Carrington seemed to be a sore loser in general, possibly another trait inherited from his father's disposition. This is evidenced by his reluctance to concede even the tiniest bit of ground to his enemies, or even just those who happened to stand in his way. 
Eventually, Avery would decide that even Texas wasn't big enough for his ego, and decide to move his primary business interests to the sunny state of Florida. More specifically, the den of sin, misery, and cocaine that was Vice City in the 1980s. It isn't known exactly when Avery moved his business to Vice, however, it was likely by at least 1982 or earlier, as by 1986, he would already be finished construction of a massive development near, presumably, the Gator Keys. This construction development would be an upper-class condominium complex outside of Vice City, Shady Acres. Although its likely owners have since changed hands, we still attempted to find details on when, how, or even where the development was constructed, but our inquiry attempts were continuously rejected, with the reason cited being that we were far too poor to even visit, let alone be approved for on-site filming. I'm a VIP, and I want to live around people just like myself, rich and divorced. Shady Acres. I'm Everett Karen. Shady Acres is an incredible, upscale, state-of-the-art, top-notch condominium development. Condo. A short drive out of town on some pristine wetlands, away from the noise and uninvited diversity of the city. Shady Acres. And when you buy into that dream that is Shady Acres, not only do you get a luxurious 5,000-square-foot condo with underground parking for your newly acquired sports car, but there's also a jacuzzi for entertaining. Jacuzzi. Each condo is tastefully furnished with a stock bar and an exotic waterbed shaped like a dollar sign. Shady Acres also has a golf range, firing range, helipad, and exotic petting zoo when your kids come to visit. You're successful? Start defining your lifestyle. Start defining yourself. Shady Acres. Shady Acres. Happiness is worth the price. Shady It is assumed that Shady Acres, like all of Carrington's projects, was built by his private construction company, Avery Construction. However, representatives from the company refused to speak with us, and any direct proof linking Avery to the company itself has yet to be found, leading some to assume the two are entirely unconnected. Regardless of how he got it done, Avery would indeed get Shady Acres built, and begin to reap the profits from advertising exclusively to rich, middle-aged white men with plenty of money to burn. But one enormous and exceedingly profitable development in Vice City would of course not be enough for the greedy and ruthless cowboy, and soon enough, he would begin seeking new opportunities to expand his interests across the city and the state. Avery was never known to have married in his life, for reasons even we will not speculate on, and as a result, he would have no known children, but still have a desire to impart his particular brand of wisdom onto a new generation. To accomplish this, Avery would, by 1986, take backstabber and training Donald Love under his wing, and drag him all around Vice City to various meetings and deals in order to show Donald the ropes of extreme capitalism as he saw it. Despite his willingness to train Donald, he would be incredibly dismissive of his protege, seeming to keep him around more to boost his own ego than to actually teach the man anything. But nonetheless, many of Avery's lessons would become embedded in Donald's mind, and eventually, Avery's ego would come back to haunt him. In the meantime, though, he would seek legal counsel for his many highly illegal activities from well-known criminal lawyer Ken Rosenberg, and the two would quickly form an effective mutual business relationship. He would also become well-known enough among relevant circles to be invited to yacht parties hosted by the retired Colonel Juan Garcia Cortez, with one such party, believed to be the last of its kind, taking place in early 1986. Sometime after the completion of Shady Acres, Avery would purchase the rights to land formerly used for the Washington Beach Fairground, and presumably demolish it himself. Although he would acquire rights to nearly all of the land for his next construction project, a small delivery company, Spand Express, would continue to hang on, refusing to sell their lot. Seeking any and all avenues to push them out of the area, Avery would approach one of Vice City's most resourceful lawyers for legal advice on how best to proceed. Rosenberg would spill a sob story to Avery about a botched drug deal he'd helped set up between the Ferrelli crime family and the Vance crime empire, as well as the lone Ferrelli survivor, who was now tasked with helping him clean up the mess, Tommy Rossetti. Seeing a perfect opportunity for mutual criminal aid, Avery would volunteer to help the stressed-out mobsters, provided they first help him with his spandex problem. 
Avery goes without saying. Tommy, Tommy, any progress? No, 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 no. Tell me later, tell me later. Tommy, this is Avery Carrington. I believe you met at the party? Not in person. Howdy. Avery here has a proposition. <clears throat> Haven't we got other things on our mind? I'm trying to keep the wolves from the door. So could you please cut me some slack? I'm stretched like a wire, and even if I'm dead by the end of the week, I'd like to think that I didn't die poor. Now just okay? calm down, both of you. Son, you help me, and any grease balls giving you a hard time, I'll see to it they take a long dirt nap. Okay, what could I do for you? This delivery company's got its depot on some prime land. They won't sell. They're hanging on like a big old prairie rat. So we gotta go in there and smoke that vermin out. Head on down there and stir up a hornet's nest. The security will have their hands full, and then you can sneak in and put them out of business. And you could drop by Raphael's for a change of clothes. You might be there a while, but yeah, go for it. Should be a riot. If the balls drop like they should, stop by my office sometime. Tommy would don a Spand Express uniform and proceed to incite a violent riot during a quite conveniently timed strike, slipping past the fighting to destroy several of the company's trucks in hopes of putting the whole operation out of business. With Spand dealt with, Avery would, we assume, finally purchase the remaining lot that once made up the Washington Beach Fairground, though the Spand Express headquarters would remain undisturbed for at least the duration of 1986. Avery wouldn't stop there, however, always needing more land and more projects to keep himself busy doing what he did best. Knowing he now had a particularly useful resource available to him in Tommy Versetti, Avery would make the most of his situation and continue to employ Tommy's services in dealing with property disputes. He would attempt to buy some unidentified land shortly after the Spandex riot, and when his initial offer was refused, he would immediately turn to Tommy for a more direct approach in getting what he wanted. Come in and park yourself on the hide, son. Hell, my daddy used to say, never look a gift horse in the mouth. And by golly, he never did. Would you like a drop of the old Kentucky? No thanks. A clean thinker. I like that. Now, the property business isn't all about highfalutin paper pushing. It's about dirt, and the will to claim that dirt. You with me, son? Oh, yeah. Well, I need some tenacious bastard to let go of some dirt. And you look to me like the kind of guy to persuade him. Persuasion's my forte. Yeah, he'll be down at the country club, down on the golf course. They don't allow guns, so his bodyguards won't be packing lawgivers. Go beat eight tons of crap out of him. Here, now, I got you a membership. And boy, you're gonna need more appropriate clothing. Once again, Tommy would make a suitable change of clothes in order to sneak into the LeafLinks Golf Club and make the hardballing developer change his mind. Unfortunately for him, however, Tommy's method of ensuring Avery got the deal he was after involved outright murder, and after disposing of the developer and his guards, he would flee the country club and return to Avery for his payment and yet another criminal scheme. Catching on quickly, Tommy would by then have a firm grasp on the kind of man Avery was and as a result, would barely need an explanation when the cowboy revealed his next rodeo. The final piece of the puzzle in this Washington Beach redevelopment project would require the destruction of an adjacent building site across the street from his. Seeing as construction had already begun on the other site, Avery would employ Tommy to use remote control explosives to anonymously decommission the building by force. He would even leave town during the attack to add plausible deniability to his innocence. Now look here, son. I got a problem, and I reckon you could help me with it. I'm no builder. No, I was thinking more of your demolition skills. Now this here, this is the development as planned, and this, this is the property that we're looking at. You're trying to say this new office block is kind of in the way. You catch on quick. Now I'm gonna head out of town for a while, and if that office development would have faced sudden and insurmountable structural problems, then I... As a civil-minded individual, you feel obliged to step in and save the rejuvenation of an important area of the city. Where can I get more guys like you? With his Washington Beach project finally clear of all roadblocks, Avery would next turn his eye to the low-income sections of the Vice City mainland, primarily Little Havana and Little Haiti. Having no shame whatsoever, he envisioned a new scheme to drive down prices in the neighborhoods so that his company could buy up the land at a profit, and then more than likely, redevelop it into more pristine condominiums. 
Avery would hire Tommy Rossetti one last time in 1986 to disguise himself as a Cuban gangster and provoke a full-scale gang war, capitalizing on the recent death of a high-ranking Haitian soldier who was rumored to have been killed by the Cubans. Tommy, this is Donald Love. Donald, this is Tommy Vercetti, the latest gunslinger to come to these parts. Now, Donald, you just shut up and listen, and you might learn something. Now, nothing brings down real estate prices quicker than a good old-fashioned gang war. Except maybe a disaster, like a biblical plague or something, but that may be going too far in this case. You getting this down, you four-eyed prick? Now, recently a Haitian gang lord died. Apparently the Cubans did it. Nobody's certain, but let's make them certain. You disguise yourself as a Cuban hombre and head on down and crash that funeral. Mix it up, and then hightail it. You getting this down, Donald? Well, that ought to put the coyote in the chicken coop, huh? And then we'll just sit back and watch the prices tumble. His plan would indeed work, and it is believed that sometime after 1986, prices in these areas had fallen significantly, likely further lowered when the war concluded with an enormous explosion at a Haitian drug factory. Though details on what Avery got up to in Vice City following the Cuban-Haitian gang war are ambiguous, one thing for certain is that he would remain connected to Tommy Versetti for presumably quite some time, even occasionally offering the rising kingpin advice in regards to building a legitimate criminal empire using business assets. Oh, we gotta redecorate this place! We gotta make it look older! I can't stand this look! Tommy, what do you say? What do you say we put a bar in the- You're my lawyer, Rosenberg, not my interior decorator. Got it? Listen to me. The time to take over this town is now. It's all out there waiting for us. We need to start seizing territory. And let Vice City know we're the new players in town. You know what I'm saying? What you need is a legitimate front, Tommy. Real estate. It's never done me no harm. We need to start using some muscle. Or we can kiss all that hard work goodbye. Local business know Diaz is dead, and they're refusing to pay protection. Oh, we could try bribery. Bribery? Screw bribery. I'll show you how to make them scared. I'll be back here in five minutes. In fact, it seems entirely possible, if not likely, that Avery and Tommy continued to work together right up until Avery's departure from Vice City, or even his death. After the Versetti gang became the dominant crime family in the city, it is believed that Avery's many construction projects from the 80s would be completed, but we have no reason to believe a man such as him would be keen on slowing down. Howdy, son. Just thought I'd ring you up and give you some advice. Hey, Avery, what's eating you? There's a lot of opportunity in this town if you own the right real estate. You catch my drift? I reckon so. All I'm saying is keep your eyes open, and you might find the perfect business opportunity. I'll catch you later. Later, Avery. Whatever Avery did between 1986 and 1992, it would propel him to the status of cultural icon, with many suggesting that he got involved with developing for casinos in Las Venturas, given his appearance on the old Venturas strip. Eventually, Avery would once again decide to move his business interests to another corner of the nation, this time the Northeast, in the miserable state of Liberty, specifically Liberty City. He would, we speculate, attempt to get on the good side of the then mayor, Roger C. Hole, by presumably bribing him or using other underhanded means to get a foothold in the Liberty City construction market. But surprisingly, the mayor would resist. Already bought by the Ferrelli crime family who held a considerable amount of power in the city at the time, Avery would instead be forced to try another tactic, given the high-class nature of his new opponent, defamation. He would email Liberty Tree reporter Ned Burner in 1998 in an attempt to bribe Burner into printing stories regarding the mayor's corruption. Ned, good to finally talk to you the other day. You know what I always say? Well, no, of course you don't. We've never met. And also, I don't always say the same thing. I'm not a goddamn parrot. I am a success story, and I didn't get to where I am today by acting like a sissy or giving in to bullies, no sir. I got where I am today by stabbing people in the back, bribing, and threatening people, and generally making a nuisance of myself. That, and artificially manipulating property prices. So Ned, how about it? What do you make, a newspaperman? 60, 70 grand? Well, write what I want and I'll pay you 200 grand, in cash. Have we got a deal? I recommend you say yes, because if you try and play hardball with me, I'll have you killed and be proud of myself for doing so. Business is like war, only without the Geneva Convention to hold us back. May the best man win. So listen, Ned, dear boy, take the money and start telling the truth about the mayor. We all know that Hull has been taking bribes from the mob for years and is in bed with some of the biggest names in American construction. Some, but not me. Either we correct that, or we disgrace him, or we kill him. Come on, Ned, tell the world. The man is a fraud and a liar and a crappy politician. We gotta save this town, you and me. 
Carrington. But anyone who knows Liberty City history can tell you that Mayor Hull wouldn't have long to even be defamed, given that his assassination would take place that same year. In a case of irony so palpable that even Avery would find it bitter, he would soon discover that one of the candidates running to replace Mayor Hull would be his own protege, Donald Love, but no correspondence was known to have taken place between the two since at least the 1980s. Love would lose his bid for election and find himself a broken, poor man, but Avery would be none the wiser, no longer interested in his one-time student and instead interested in securing yet another lucrative deal. Deciding to go around the new mayor, Miles O'Donovan, Avery would make a deal with the Panlantic Construction Company, a front for the Colombian cartel operating out of Liberty, and arrive in person at Francis International Airport with intentions to inspect the site guarded by his new cartel allies. However, Avery would make the fatal mistake of underestimating how much he taught Donald Love, and en route to Fort Staunton, he would be assassinated by Tony Sobriani of the Leone crime family, working under orders from both Salvatore Leone and Donald Love himself. Tony, my ex-mentor, Avery Carrington, is flying into town today. It's come to my attention that he's working for the Panlantic Corporation. They'll do anything to get primary in the state. So kind of we have to get hold of his plans to acquire land. If being killed under orders from his own former criminal student wasn't insulting enough, Avery's death would be further trivialized when his corpse was stolen alongside that of Ned Burner and delivered to Donald Love at his private hangar in Francis International Airport. As Love fled the city temporarily to allow the heat he'd come under to die down, he would bring the corpses with him for nefarious purposes and return by at least early 2001, having fully, finally embraced the lessons that Avery taught him after eating his dead body. Avery! Oh, Avery, how you've aged since we've last met. You used to feed me such pearls of wisdom, and soon I shall dine again. My God, he's wearing a wig! Avery Carrington was above all else ruthless. He was never known to take no for an answer, and would happily undermine, bribe, or kill just about anybody who sought to deprive him of whatever it is he set his sights on that day. He was arrogant, violent, and condescending, always maintaining an air of criminal wisdom to those he sought to indoctrinate, and seemed to always find a way of bringing up his father in casual conversation. His callous and seemingly cavalier approach to even the most serious of matters may have contributed to his never having been married though it's also entirely possible he was simply married to his job. Very little is known about his personal life, but as we mentioned earlier, he was not known to have had children, and this may have been the reason he initially took on Donald Love as a protege and pseudo-son, despite effectively abandoning him later on and constantly dismissing Donald when he was around. Avery was described even by the VCPD as an extreme capitalist, and this could be seen in his constant and forceful expansion across the country, making his mark in Vice City, San Andreas, and even attempting to get a foothold in Liberty City before his assassination. The extreme here also refers to his knack for using highly illegal hostile takeover tactics to push whoever opposed him out of the game, as well as his ability to weasel out of any responsibility for such actions using his favorite excuse, plausible deniability. Much like his protege, whom we covered in the premiere of this season, Avery Carrington represented the very worst that the American business mentality had to offer. Hyper-violent, emotionally detached, and entirely self-serving, with the only people he himself respected being similarly ruthless businessmen, such as Tommy Rossetti. As with many of the criminals we have examined this season, information on the full extent of Avery's potential criminal history is difficult to come by, and as such, we must emphasize the title of this section, Known Crimes. We have absolutely no doubt that had an official investigation been launched by the authorities, far more dirt would have been found from his many years as a real estate mogul across the country, but given that his most notorious and well-documented years were during his association to Tommy Versetti, the bulk of his crimes we can attribute to him come from this era, starting with Conspiracy accessory murder, inciting a riot, assault, and destruction of private property when hiring Tommy Rossetti to destroy several Spant Express delivery vans. 
conspiracy accessory murder when hiring Tommy to eliminate a rival land developer who was refusing to sell. Conspiracy accessory murder, destruction of private property, and terrorism when hiring Tommy Rossetti to destroy a construction site opposite his own in order to claim the land, resulting in the deaths of several workers. And conspiracy accessory murder when hiring Tommy to incite a gang war between the Haitians and Cubans. Given that Avery was later known to have worked with the Colombian cartel and spent many years using the same tactics around the country, it is almost a given certainty that had we the proper resources, we could have dug up a mountain of similar charges from Avery's many years buying and selling land around America. As things stand, however, this represents just a tiny fraction of what one powerful, no-nonsense American capitalist can do in just one city in just one year when given the proper tools. What turns a man to extreme capitalism? Is it the easily exploitable masses just begging to have their wallets emptied, or pure necessity in this hyper-competitive dystopia we find ourselves trapped in day in and day out? It's not for us to say, but what we will say is America is a dangerous place, folks. Stay indoors, people. You never know if that friendly gent with a 10-gallon hat that you wave to is actually planning to buy your house and demolish it in order to make room for a condo you most certainly can't afford. I'll see you next time on another exciting edition of Grand Theft Autobiographies with me, your host, Guinness Walker. Thank you for watching.